Welcome, and thank you for joining us as we celebrate Epiphany. I'm Deacon David Hope Tringali, and before we begin our worship, I wanted to take a minute to extend a few special thank yous to some individuals and groups who made this service possible. To the Reverend Karen Castillo, President of the Augustinian Lutheran Church of Guatemala, for taking time to record our closing benediction. To the Reverend Nellie Miranda, the priest in charge of St. Albans Episcopal Mission in Antigua, Guatemala, for providing our gospel reading. To the Reverend Victoria Larson from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Westboro, Massachusetts, for our pre- and post-gospel canticles. And to Faith X and Kristen Mom for providing their musical talents today. I invite you now to take a moment as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. We want to take a moment and welcome you to our Epiphany service. No matter where you are on your faith or life journey, you are welcome here. If you are young or old, or young at heart, or feeling old, you are welcome. If you are married or single or divorced, you are welcome. If you are happy or sad or anxious, you are welcome. If you struggle with your identity or are confident in your identity, you are welcome. If you are rich or poor, sick or well, you are welcome. Whether your skin is black, brown, or white, you are welcome. If you believe in God all of the time, some of the time, or not at all, you are welcome. Come with your pains and sorrows. Come with your fear and brokenness. Come with a mind that is open and a heart that is ready to give and receive love and compassion. You are welcome in this space. We begin this Epiphany service in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. God, for longer than we can imagine, you have been forming and reforming your people of faith. We now gather in community to celebrate your presence with us. God, creator of all that exists, parent who nurtures and gives life, show us your love. Jesus the Christ, light and life, liberator of sin, Restorer of wholeness and justice, show us your grace. Holy Spirit, fountain of faith, cultivator of gifts within us, show us your transformation. Amen. Amen. Before we move toward recognition of our own faults, I would like to offer an apology on behalf of the church. For anyone watching who feels the church may have ignored you, judged you, or rejected you, for any pain, hurt, division, or betrayal, 
church may have caused, I am deeply sorry and offer an apology. Nothing can undo the wrong you have endured, and I hope for you deep inner healing and peace. We live in a broken world, and we admit we are flawed. We can be selfish and uncaring toward others. Let us now recognize our faults. Please feel free to respond with us with, We are sorry, God. For wasting and polluting creation, We are sorry, God. For the ways we use words and body language that isolate and hurt others, We are sorry, God. For the anger and impatience we express toward those we love, We are sorry, God. For our blindness to human need and suffering, We are sorry, God. For prejudice, alienation, and judgment we have against those who are different from us, We are sorry, God. Have mercy on us and forgive us. Renew us and bring us closer to you and to each other. Amen. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake God forgives you all your sin. Blessed are you. Rejoice and be glad, beloved people of God. Amen. Amen. A reading from Isaiah, the 60th chapter, verses 1 to 6. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look around. They all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from far away, and your daughters shall be carried on their nurses' arms. Then you shall see and be radiant, your heart shall thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea shall be brought to you, the wealth of the nations shall come to you. A multitude of camels shall cover you, the young camels of Midian and Ephah, all those from Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and frankincense and shall proclaim the praise of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. In the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem asking, Where is the child who has been born King of the Jews? For we observed his star at his rising and have come to pay him homage. When King Herod heard this, he was frightened, and all Jerusalem with him, and calling together all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Messiah was to be born. They told him in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it has been written by the prophet, and you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Then he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, so that I may also go and pay him homage. When they had heard the king, they set out, and there ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising, until it stopped over the place where the child was. When they saw that the star had stopped, they were overwhelmed with joy. On entering the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they knelt down and paid him homage. 
then opening the treasure chests they offered him gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh and having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod they left for their own country by another road this is the gospel of our Lord Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, the one who shines throughout all the world. Amen. Arise, Magi, do you see the sign? A star shines brightly in the evening sky. From the east you wander, where is he, you wonder? What wonder will you find beneath that star? Arise, Joseph and Mary, because what is customary? Not good manners, but law, when wanderers you saw, necessitated hospitality, and not just pleasantries, not commodified or countrified, but made holy, sanctified, by remembrance of ancestral history, you were strangers in a strange land. So though they might have thought them strange, into their household the Magi came, Shelter and welcome gave the holy family to the traveling wise men three. Arise, Mary and Joseph, shine. Arise, shine, for the light has come. The Magi indeed were overcome with the glory of the Lord, the Son of God in Christ adored. They threw themselves upon the ground, that baby and mother they did surround, the first to worship Jesus as king these outsiders with treasures to bring, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh, showing forth what would occur, divinity would not deter, harsh deliverance. Arise, shine, Jesus. Back to our story, Epiphany. We see the Holy Family Three did host those astrologers three, one household together they would be sharing food, drink, and story. I wonder, was there laughter? Did Jesus tug on a beard? Or coo at music offered by one? Did Mary smile while watching her son? Arise, shine, Jesus. Those three men were very wise. A dream warned them of Herod's lies, and so they did not return. A different way they would sojourn, changed by the light. Arise, shine, magi. Herod arose. When the magi did not return, Herod's heart with scorn did burn. King Herod had such tremendous power that his rage would soon devour babies. Babies killed for the possibility that king one day they would be, imagine the mourning and agony. Arise, Joseph, a dream did warn of Herod's scorn. Get up and flee, go to safety. 
Egypt is your destination. Protect your baby from assassination. On hospitality, your family will rely, hoping no one will deny a welcome that you once extended, but will now be dependent on to live. Arise, Joseph and Mary, protect the light. Arise, shine, do we see the sign? Who are the wanderers of our time? People wander from other places, a diversity of cultures and races. Some have been wandering about, starving from multiple years of drought as a result of climate change brought to them in exchange for those who have to have more, and so they leave for distant shore. And many from the South have wandered, father, brother, sister, mother, those who have no place to rest, who left their home in great duress, seeking refuge from violence, embraced instead with metal fence. Peace to this house and all who enter here does not apply to those fleeing in fear. While some use chalk to mark their doors, maybe instead we should mark the floors of the treacherous paths our siblings trod, who are made in the image of God. May Christ bless their camino. Arise, saints who wander, while we sinners wonder. We are called to act with hospitality and generosity, but in reality, our siblings face inequity, frugality, brutality, and even fatality. Upon extended welcome, they will rely, but to these wanderers we deny dignity, family, education. But the light has come. Christ the anointed has appointed you and me. Can we quell our instinct to colonize, instead building courage to antagonize our status quo and cultural norms, seeking instead to conform to God's desire for everyone, shown to us by God's Son, life, where everyone has enough rather than some having lots of stuff, a world where the light shines bright, wouldn't that be God's delight? And what if we could all remember our mandate and spark an ember to light up the wanderer's way and invite them to stay in our household like Joseph and Mary welcomed those magi as was contrary to the status quo of their time, but their faith required them to shine, shine. Arise. Do we recognize our ancestors once to a land were strange, and so our faith requires us to arrange our priorities to first claim the wanderer, not as just neighbor, but sister, brother, the wandering child as our daughter and son, extending a long welcome to everyone inviting those different in our neighborhoods to share food, drink, and story, and then would our fear and uneasiness dissipate as love and compassion accumulate? And what about those who cannot flee, lacking access to opportunity, suffering within their countries of birth? Can we recognize their worth as siblings who carry God's image, our global family deserving homage, can you and I get to know each other as son, daughter, sister, brother, struggling together to prevent migration, working for justice in every nation, addressing root causes of poverty, which might require you and me to loosen our hold on our stuff, to recognize we have enough, to honor and value other cultures and places, to see God's image in other races, and one final curiosity, a revealing of God, an epiphany. Maybe the one offering hospitality is not only you and me. Just as the Christ child welcomed the Magi and continuously welcomes you and I, a king born in an unlikely place who freely gave himself for every land and race, could it also be the wanderer that we see? looks at their stranger who is you and me, 
with the image of God in their eyes bringing treasures we don't recognize because they come to us in swaddling cloth, dirty from traveling through the manger trough. But if our scales would finally sloth, prejudice and judgment falling off, we might see their light within unfold and realize that we are beholding God with us. Arise, shine. Do you see the treasure? God's own pleasure? Gold, frankincense, and myrrh are brought by those who we label distraught, carrying to us treasures untold, resilience, perspective, varieties of gold, inviting us to share life together, a connection that should not tether, as it was created by God's own self, not based on status or on wealth, but on our common flaw to sin, needing forgiveness to enter in, brought to us in form of child, God with us, reconciled. Arise, shine, your light has come. What do we wander in search of, listening for good news of? The Magi searched for the Prince of Peace, our wanderers now for suffering to cease, with fear and greed being our disease, and so we ask Emmanuel, oh please, Give us the courage to do what's right for those who wander all through the night. Empower us, Spirit, to be so bold, our baptismal promise to uphold, to seek justice and peace in all the earth, not just in the country of our birth. Willingness to embrace humility and even more vulnerability, to recognize gifts within each other, to name the stranger sister brother, a mutual long welcome and embrace as we dwell in each other's space, which was never actually ours to claim, but the property of the one who reigns, the child, the light who did stand upon Calvary with nails in his hands, emptying and suffering for our salvation, not reserving himself for just one nation, but sacrificing for all God's family, love incarnate deity, freeing you and I to act by faith, to unabashedly love even when afraid, as we trust in the Savior's promise of eternal life and forgiveness. Christ, the light for us all, brings hope and healing when we fall. So arise, shine, everyone, embrace God's light, and then come together as one family, remembering Epiphany, sharing love and hope and faith. Thanks be to God for Christ's grace. Amen. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of God has dawned upon you. And we'll now offer a litany of hope as prepared by Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. Lord, you send out your spirit and renew the face of the earth. Look with love on all those you have created. Help us to see your image in the many peoples of this earth. 
Open your hand to fill all your children with good things. Call us to care for all who are hungry and without shelter. For families separated at the border. Teach us to provide protection and hope. For members of our church and community who suffer fear and isolation. Give us hearts filled with generosity and welcome. For refugees who long for home. Fill us with grace to embrace them as sisters and brothers. Lord, send out your spirit. And renew the face of the earth. For all who flee poverty, persecution, war, and violence. Let us walk with them as they make new beginnings. For all who learn a new language, start a new enterprise, make a new friend. Let us celebrate the many gifts they bring. For the whole human family brought together in your love. We rejoice in the Lord. Lord, you send out your spirit. And renew the face of the earth. Let us now join together praying the words that Jesus taught us. Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. To bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. I'm Deacon David Hope Tringali. I'm Pastor Jennifer Hope Tringali. Uh, we are global missionaries for the Lower Susquehanna Synod, and we're in Guatemala. So a long time ago, Jennifer started a nonprofit called Tree for Hope, uh, and it's continued to grow and expand. And currently, we are working on managing a school for girls who live in really rough conditions to make sure they have access to quality STEAM bilingual education. Yeah, the girls in this village often are denied space in the public school. They prefer to give the boys space. Um, and girls are often kept home to help with housework and take care of children. And so we have, over the last 15 years, met a lot of girls who never started school or who started school and dropped out because they just didn't have support. And so it was a long-term visioning process that we, in conjunction with our partners at an orphanage and uh, the village outside of the orphanage had together. And we started visioning what would it look like to provide this support and give an opportunity to girls who didn't have an opportunity for education. And what would that do um, to not just the lives of the girls, but the lives of people from the entire community. Yeah, the short story as to how uh, we became involved in Guatemala is it all started uh, with the adoption of my son, Jonathan. And that was in 2003. That's what led me originally to Guatemala. And while that adoption was going on, I ended up living in Guatemala with my four and six year old daughters and my fostering my son, Jonathan, who was one. And we had the opportunity to participate in Christmas parties with our adoption agency. It was the first time that many orphanages ever had Christmas parties. And so while we were uh, participating and and spending time with the kids in the orphanage, my kids were getting to kind of experience what life was like here for other children in Guatemala. And so a significant thing happened for me as a mom, which was when I returned to Pennsylvania at the end of the adoption and walked into uh, my house in Pennsylvania, which um, the kitchen was the size of a bedroom that housed 25 kids in Guatemala. It was very humbling um, to walk into that space. And my six-year-old daughter said, mom, what are we going to do for the kids who are still in Guatemala? And uh, how do you respond to a question from a six-year-old? Well, I decided to answer with a question and said, well, what do you think we should do? And a six-year-old 
Jessica said, well, the kids are poor, we should send money. And so we tried to have a conversation about poverty and how that could be affected, but at a six-year-old level. And so then her new idea was we should send toys to the kids at the orphanage. But then we talked about how that could actually cause problems with the caregivers who one caregiver was caring for like 25 children. So then uh, we had this idea that we would enlist the help of kids in Pennsylvania, and it ended up being um, throughout a couple different states where they would make fleece blankets that the, the ends of the fleece blankets would be cut and tied into knots and that we would deliver these fleece blankets at Christmas time to kids at the orphanage so that each of them would have one, they wouldn't have to fight over them and they would feel and know that somebody cared or loved them. And so we went the next Christmas and delivered 385 blankets. And then the following year, Hurricane Stan happened and it turned into a massive effort um, with a delivery of 1,800 blankets. We actually uh, coordinated a container of food and hygiene supplies. Um, Mission Central and Bethesda Mission helped out and sent things. And then people started asking, could we go with you to Guatemala? And so we started forming at that point the nonprofit Tree for Hope, which had its roots in our home congregation Tree of Life, who for years helped with coordinating um, the efforts in Guatemala with the orphanage. Started out with the orphanage focusing on agriculture, healthcare, education, youth empowerment, and we would have relationship building trips where people would travel and get to know kids and then be able to support some of the programming that the orphanage identified as uh, needed. And so that's kind of how all of the things got started and just grew from there into this really long-term partnership we've had now with the directors of the orphanage. They're actually on our board of our association here in Guatemala. So we, while we have a 501c3 in the United States, we also have a nonprofit association in Guatemala that has a board of all Guatemalans except for me. And we, um, that's the kind of overseeing body of Hope Academy, the school for girls. And so how this turned into a call um, a few years into all of this, we started talking with the directors of the orphanage because we wanted to create real change. We didn't want to just come and put a Band-Aid on a problem or come on a mission trip and feel good about ourselves. And so the conversation started, what do you really need to make real change in these communities? And they said pretty quickly, educate our girls. And so we started looking for land to build a school and fundraising for this project. Um, and how long did all of that take? Yeah, fundraising for the land took several years and mm -hmm. then constructing the school took several years. And during that time, a lot of partnerships were formed with churches in the Lower Susquehanna Synod. We've had support of a lot of congregations for many, many years now. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the children and the, from both the village and the orphanage have been forming relationships that now, gosh, some of them are now over 10 years with mm -hmm. um, people from congregations in the Lower Susquehanna Synod. And so actually a lot of the girls and the kids refer to the people that they know as their padrinos or their godparents mm -hmm. at this point. And so after years of fundraising, we broke ground in 2017 on uh, just before Thanksgiving. And the plan was to let the school build and we assumed it would take two or three years and then we would slowly start out adding one grade at a time. Um, but on our trip here in January of 2018, I believe it was 2018, and the directors of our orphanage were like, we have all of these kindergarten age girls who were told there's no space for them in school. Can you start school for them now? And so we called up all of the people we were working with. We already had our director of our school here and we had a few teachers in mind and we're like, who can do this now? Now. <laughs> like, can we start school in two weeks? The orphanage offered us a room to use while our building was under construction. And so, um, we, to 2019, 2019. This we, started was 2019. Our, yeah. we started our very first class of kindergartners mm -hmm. uh, at the orphanage or uh, Hope Academy and then we started on location we broke ground we broke our we had our ribbon cutting ceremony 
-hmm. last year. Yeah. Started with up through um, programming up through grade four. We had at the school up through grade first grade and then um, opened in January. And then we had to close the building in March mm -hmm. <laughs> with COVID. Um, so we had a very difficult year this past year because our girls are from a village where um, they have no running water. So it's very hard to wash your hands and keep good hygiene with COVID um, with no running water. Most don't have uh, concrete floors even. So there's, so when it rains, the, the floor of your house could be water and there could be garbage running through it. Um, there's no sewer in the area. So it's just, it's a very difficult place to have um, a level of hygiene that they've been asked to have with COVID. And so we've been really working with the families this year as to how can we keep educating the girls, which had to be by paper packet because there is no internet. Um, it's too expensive for the families. So our teachers last year were super creative and created packets every um, to go to the girls that were weekly packets for them to do while they were at home to continue their learning. And these packets were delivered during our monthly or bi-monthly food distribution. So we ended up having support from, again, a lot of congregations and individuals because the families when COVID hit were very isolated and had no way of working or having any income to provide food for their families. And so a lot of families we heard from were really hungry and, um, at the Lower Susquehanna Synod, where hunger is one of our primary priorities, um, this really touched our hearts. And so uh, we were able to coordinate with the orphanage again to have food distributed to about 100 families. And this has been ongoing since April. Um, we've had food going to the entire family of not just the girls from Hope Academy, but a lot of the kids in the village who are just at really high risk for hunger and poverty. Um, we had one um, member who would generously provided a meal for December and Christmas to be special as well. So they were able to have traditional uh, tamales and Guatemalan um, celebration foods and drinks for their food distribution in December. So we're reevaluating what we need to do for this year with that currently. Um, they not only have the what I described from COVID, but they've been experiencing food shortage due to climate change and drought for years now. And so uh, these areas have been particularly isolated and, and hit hard. And so um, we're working on how we can be better partners with, the, with this um, Lutheran church body as well during this time. Um, so we're excited about our call here. Um, There's so many possibilities <laughs> and so many things that we would love to show people who can travel here and be with us in the future when it's safe to be here with us. And um, teachers experience joy in cooking together, cooking together uh, within a family unit, which is usually an extended family unit. Um, brought a lot of joy this holiday season to our teachers. Uh, one of our music teacher, he had a uh, vocal cord surgery a couple years ago, and this year for the first time was able to sing at Christmas time, and that brought him such joy. Um, so all of these things that maybe I realized uh, I might take for granted, like my voice um, or cooking, these are joys that our teachers experienced and was great perspective to share. Um, brings richness to me and we hope to pass on the richness of what we are learning here to uh, people within the Lower Susquehanna Synod in a variety of ways, whether it's by experiencing things here in Guatemala or by us being able to communicate in both video and word, um, things that would enrich our faith journey together. Working in Guatemala has really dramatically affected my faith journey and Jennifer's as well, but I'll let her speak to hers on her own in a minute here. But for me, it's all about finding and seeing Christ in our neighbor. And sometimes we get so insulated to that in the communities we live in, you know, 
Lower Susquehanna Synod, for better or for worse, we've got a really, a lot of really nice, you know, upper middle class neighborhoods that many of us live in. It's really easy to put up our blinders and not see the people in need who were called to serve as the church. And when we come to Guatemala and work with the communities we work with, we really, we realize how much we take for granted. You know, we work with kids in an orphanage, we work with families in a very impoverished village, and they share their stories and their life experiences with us and invite us wholeheartedly to walk on that journey with them. And that's powerful. And after you experience that, you can't go back to your own home and not see those same communities where you are. You know, we're called to give food to the hungry and drink to the thirsty and clothe the naked and to visit those who are isolated or imprisoned. And within the ministry work we do here in Guatemala, that's everything we're doing. Um, and the ability to bring others along on that journey from other churches in our synod is really a gift. It allows us to accompany our neighbor and to see Christ in all people and all walks of life. So my journey started here as a mom. And so I, I have um, a deep heart connection with family here in Guatemala now, but that is actually what led me to seminary because in doing the, what was originally called humanitarian aid work here with the adoption agency led people here to identify in me a role as a faith leader. So I had people in Guatemala ask uh, what my, you know, what my position was in the church because of the work I was doing here. Um, here, people were identifying, I guess what we would call an, uh, it's an external call. They were identifying in me part of my faith call that I was not aware of and, and naming it. And so then I was like, well, I don't feel prepared for this. I don't feel like I have enough education. So I went to audit some classes at seminary and then I was asked why I was there. And I said, well, people in Guatemala are seeing me in a faith leadership role, and I don't know what that means. And so that really led me on a very deep journey. Um, I had always um, seen examples of Christ here in people that I was meeting and forming relationship with. And so that uh, growing closer to Christ really happened for me in a deep way in Guatemala. And then through seminary, um, I, I felt like I became more educated <laughs> into what I was being called into. And so uh, for me, my call was always connected in uh, relationship, service, word and sacrament, in being a bridge between here and um, the United States. And so it's a deepening of faith that I feel was gifted to me by people and experiences that I had here um, along with the Holy Spirit guiding me. And I'm very thankful for that. Um, it's been a joy to be able to walk with people from the United States in experiencing um, deepening of faith and, and, and noticing that there are so many gifts that people have from around the world and in our own neighborhoods that maybe we don't recognize as a gift. Maybe we often see ourselves as the ones who are giving, but we are receiving a lot. And so to, to go through that process of transformation and uh, realization of an exchange of gifts as part of God's family, as siblings in Christ, we are working together and learning together and loving together. And that is really a gift from God to be able to have the opportunity. And so, um, yeah, that has really deepened my own personal faith journey. And that's what I love sharing with other people. And we've been given the great opportunity to co-chair the Amparo Task Force that the Lower Susquehanna Synod has. And for us, this is really a privilege because we get to build those bridges now much more viscerally with the two communities we love. We get to bring our friends and family from Lower Susquehanna here to Guatemala, and we get to build those real authentic relationships. And when we're able to see our neighbors as people and not just as statistics or not with some Mr. Hayes of media fear, um, 
really amazing things start to happen. We realize how much we can learn from our neighbor and how we can be transformed through those experiences. Yeah, and it's a natural um, issue for us that we're concerned about because our work here really deals with the root causes of poverty and the root causes of migration. So we know and have learned from people that in Guatemala, um, what they're experiencing and what is leading to crises and migration. And so that's what we're, our work targets to kind of address those root causes while at the same time being sensitive to and learning about uh, migration more globally. The decision to call synodical missionaries, um, particularly into Central America, was really based on two things. One, the spirit working and their excitement and enthusiasm for that work got caught up with the people in the Lower Susquehanna Synod. And so we have seen our congregations engaging in that mission work and traveling with them to be engaged with the work they're doing with the girls' school in that situation. At the same time, Jennifer and David began walking alongside both the Episcopal Church and the Lutheran Church in Guatemala and being engaged in the mission and work that they're doing. They built a relationship with the um, Bishop of the Guatemala Lutheran Church, and that relationship then fostered um, ways in which we could work alongside of the Lutherans in Guatemala. So those workings of the Spirit really created this opportunity for us. It's also important for us in that what's happening in Latin America has a real impact on us because we're seeing immigration from that region into our country. And a lot of the growth in our um, Christian community is with Hispanic people. And so we have the opportunity to really engage people where they live and to understand what the situation is in their um, countries that's um, encouraging them to come to the United States and to be engaged and involved here. And we're seeing it in our synod. We have multiple congregations who have talked to us about that their next pastor, they would like them to be fluent in Spanish because there are so many Spanish speaking people in our communities, in Upper Adams County, in the fruit um, farm area, but also in Lebanon, York and Lancaster. And so there is an opportunity for us to develop cultural competencies, particularly with our Hispanic brothers and sisters that are coming up from Central America. Um, and we recognize too, that the growth of churches in the United States, um, the, cult, the congregations who are multicultural and multiracial are the congregations that are growing because that is the nature of the population of the United States. And so um, for our congregations to continue to grow, we have got to strengthen our multicultural, multiracial um, understanding. And so this is a perfect opportunity for us to really um, learn a great deal more about what's happening in our um, brothers and sisters, our neighbors in Central America. The Lutheran Church has a deep and long history of working with immigrants. And I think this is an opportunity for us to continue the historic work of the Lutheran Church, working with our brothers and sisters from the um, Southern border. Well, from our point of view specifically, uh, if you want to get involved in the work we're doing here in Guatemala, the first thing you can do is look us up on Facebook. We're Tree, the number four, Hope, uh, Tree for Hope, or you can visit our website, treeforhope.org, to get an idea of what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, otherwise, we would love to have anyone interested uh, reach out to us via the Amparo Task Force and start to understand why is this work important? what is causing migration, what is causing poverty in these areas that we work with, and how can we as a community come together to help transform and fix this. Um, once COVID passes, we'd love to have any of you on a mission trip down here to Guatemala to start doing some of that bridge building and relationship building. And if you have more direct personal questions, we're just an email or phone call away. Yeah, and our emails are really easy now. They're just Jennifer or David 
um, at treeforhope.org. So Jennifer at treeforhope.org or David at treeforhope.org. I think that this work that we are doing with um, the global church is certainly based in our understanding of faith. Um, in our work in gathering and connecting with the church around the world, we're doing the very thing that Jesus prayed for us in John's gospel, that we would be one, that all who follow Jesus would be one. And so a sense of unity in the global community is in kind of core of how our understanding of Jesus' ministry works. But there's a deeper, longer tradition that Jesus was a part of in the Jewish faith, in which um, even as you go back into the Old Testament, into the Pentateuch, it really speaks to the need to welcome the stranger, um, to allow gleanings to stay in the field for those who come in that are foreigners to the land. Um, and so it is part of our calling um, under God's law to care for all of those who are outside of the community, including foreigners to the land. And so it is an important part of who we are as the people of God that we welcome everyone and that we care for them and that we recognize the unity that we have in Christ with all the followers of Christ, regardless of where they come from. So this is really rooted deeply in our faith and a faith of welcoming and a faith of welcoming the stranger to us.